Matt Damsker is a writer, contemporary music critic, entertainment uh, writer for the Philadelphia Evening and Sunday Bullet. And Matt Damsker is the gentleman who interviewed Bob Dylan up in Maine just a few weeks ago. Uh, Matt, I think the Q people out there would like to know uh, some details of the interview. When exactly was it? Where was it? Were you alone with Dylan? How did you feel about the whole thing? And uh, what frame of mind did you find Dylan? Yeah, well, it took place September 15th, the afternoon of the first show of the tour. He would open his tour that evening in Augusta Maine Civic Center on the campus of the university. And uh, I interviewed him at a hotel, in a motel room, actually. I guess it was his motel suite, about a mile and a half uh, from the concert hall, the Senator Motel. And uh, it was one o'clock in the afternoon. It was uh, Dylan and myself in, uh, as I say, his suite. He had some instruments there. It was a rented piano, I believe, that he was pounding out a, what sounded like an upbeat blues song. Uh, I heard him as I was you know, approaching, the, approaching the open door. Were you alone? Yeah. I was accompanied uh, at first by his press agent, Paul Wasserman, who was uh, arranged like, the whole like thing. Just introduced yourself. Yeah. Yeah. You, you've been a Dylan uh, fan or certainly a listener of his music all yeah. year, you know. I was, I was greatly influenced, I'd have to say, by Dylan's music in the 1960s. Uh, was it a bit overwhelming meeting him for the first time and, and having to sit and, you know, have a conversation, ask questions? Yeah, it was, actually. It was uh, an interview I always thought uh, would be the prize interview for someone who was covering the rock music of the 60s and 70s. Uh, and I never really expected or thought to get it, that I felt that the interviews with Dylan would remain, you know, a pretty rare commodity. And I guess, uh, I don't know, I guess when it happened, it was unreal, because... Uh... <laughs> right. And I imagine every question, because it's uh, such a rare opportunity, every question has sort of double value and uh, did you pre-plan any questions? Yes. Well, I did. I pre-planned a lot of questions. I missed the one question that I would have wanted to ask him, I think, because when he started to open up, he seemed to be pretty honest about himself what in, in a way. That was the question about uh, Reuben Hurricane Carter and his support of him. Uh, in light one. of the fact that the, that the case has sort of had a turnabout. That's the question that you forgot to ask, The right? question I didn't ask. <laughs> Well, you got a lot of good questions, and we're happy, very happy uh, uh, for the interview. This is, again, September 15th in yes. Augusta, Maine, right before the start of uh, Dylan's uh, tour opening show. Matt Damsker of the Bulletin. This is, this is a long tour, and it follows a long period of touring. Probably right. the longest period you've gone through. No. You know what it is? We used to do it more. Yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. When I was living at the Chelsea Hotel, we were touring in like eight, nine months out of every year. Nine months. Mm -hmm. That's an awful long time. Mm -hmm. And of course, when well, I moved to Woodstock, we those days were harder to it back then. Yeah. Well, what about the why? What's the motivation for all this touring these days? Well, I just uh, you can't think of nothing else I want to do right now. Really? There's gossipy reports that uh, you need to make some money. Sounds and guys. Sounds and Well, it's true to a certain extent. Uh, but money's not anything. Yeah. With the divorce and things like this, they've been oh, yeah. heavy gossip items. I guess I'm exploiting you by asking you that. No, that's, that's, that's of course all right. Uh, this, I've lost a lot of money, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think of it that way. Yeah. People analyze your stuff very seriously, and I know in reading some of the quotes you've given that you feel sometimes it's taken too seriously. For instance, the way the critics reacted to Ronaldo and Clara. Well, that I thought was shameful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. First of all, people should find out and decide for themselves if they like it or not. Mm -hmm. But these critics, what, what they, they do bring a certain amount of uh, responsibility that they have, not only to the artist, but to the public. And unless they've had the experiences that the artist has had, or can relate to those experiences, then they shouldn't be involved with that artist's work. That's what I feel. Unless they, you know, they're uh, educated in that type of music, or or have lived where that artist has lived yes. and has felt what that artist has felt and they have really no right to criticize uh, in a negative way anything which they themselves don't quite understand I mean, there's enough people out there who don't understand it anyway mm -hmm. of course you always have I'm just talking about negative critics there's a plenty of positive critics in there too mm -hmm. and uh, I imagine lots, lots of critics take sides you know mm -hmm. same way in theater I think critics just take sides I mean people are criticizers of life you know if you go over to somebody's house, if you're sitting around in somebody's house, you're always talking sometimes 
you know, you're, everybody is there is a critic on some level, on on something. But critic has take it seems just by the sound of the word, it seems to be a negative thing. Yes. So a critic is yeah, they're critical to to be critical. To put down. Right. right. Mm -hmm. So what is the opposite of a critic? A supporter. All right. So I have plenty of supporters too, so critics don't bother me. Supporter doesn't seem like a legitimate, I mean, if somebody can be completely objective, you would think that would be the best stance, but I, it doesn't seem critics can be completely objective. Well, they get paid not to be objective. <laughs> Under the pretense of objectivity, should we say. You know, right, I mean, everybody's got to be, everybody's got to make a living, you know? I'm a critic too, Bob. I've had to criticize your stuff. I mean, well, that's fine. Person. I mean, a lot of the things I've done, I need to be criticized. I agree with that. Do you find that you have gotten insights from, from criticism? No, I don't think so. Uh, but uh, I respect uh, I mean, his right, you know. Mm -hmm. He can identify with something, and it's not done his way of thinking. Well, he can criticize it, you know. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've done a, a lot of things which I criticize myself. Yeah. I understand you're cutting down uh, Ronaldo and Clara to two hours. That, that's, that's already a fact, you know. Right. Uh, I can ask, was it in response to the commercial? No, it was in response to the theater owners themselves. It wasn't in response to the people, because the people, as I understand, did to get something out of it, and will continue to. Mm -hmm. But it was a direct, uh, a direct uh, action that was done for the theater, for the theater owners. I mean, they, they just said that they couldn't show the movie. They, did, uh, they couldn't get it a fair showing at four hours because they could not get people in and out and cost them to open their doors uh -huh. too much money. Uh -huh. So, uh, yeah. um, practical matter. Yeah, it was, that's good. Right. You know, Bob, I, uh, in viewing the film, uh, there was one scene that really struck me. A scene where you jump out of the tour bus mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in New York City mm -hmm. and you sort of wander. Now, you seem to get away pretty anonymously. You hand a beggar a bill yeah. and you sort of hold your hand out as if you're a beggar. And yeah. I got an impression of that scene that it sort of represented that you were sort of looking for uh, something that was lost to you. And I began to think that maybe the whole film had something to do with that. It was the question of identity had been lost through public image. And that perhaps the real person inside had become uh, lost to this public person that everyone has uh, created. I am not what we call a commercial star. Uh -huh. You know? Yeah. Uh, so uh, you have to remember me in that light all the time. I don't sell records, you know, like Fleetwood Mac sells, mm -hmm. and I don't sell uh, uh, platinum records. Yeah. You know, I just don't. And and I sell enough, you know, but but I, I'm not a commercial star in that sense of the word. Uh, you know, yes, we sell more records than I would uh, kiss. Uh, you know, yes, you can name a lot of groups that would. And also, I'm not the type of star I'm, I'm, that is uh, uh, that assuming. I mean, there's no place I can't go or can't be or can't, nothing I can't do mm -hmm. just because uh, people might know who I am. Um, I don't live my live under those under those under that barrier. Yeah. Um, you don't feel that people are, are you're living the drama that people have created of your life. Well, no, I feel if, if I must have created the drama. I don't think other people have. Do you still see yourself, or did you ever see yourself as a, a strong moral voice? Morality is uh -huh. Yeah, I have. I've tried to be very moral in all my dealings. Uh, in an ultimate sense, uh, I've tried to remain very moral. And even uh, in my sinful ways, I see some morality coming out of the ashes. Uh, I can always reason it out in my head in some kind of way. Uh -huh. uh, we just can't be perfect. You feel it carries over into the 70s. I mean, there was such an anger and such a, it seems like such a, a righteous resentment and that consciousness in the 60s, all that was going on, all that was brewing, that you articulated very ambiguously, I suppose. Uh, you feel that it's similar in the 70s, or do you feel that everything has changed into more of an entertainment kind of thing? Because back then it did seem to be strongly tied into a message that people hadn't, uh, at least the pop music, the rock and roll music hadn't been uh, speaking to in the 50s and, uh, well, until the folk people came around in the early 60s. No, it was the Beatles that did that. Yeah. The Beatles did that, I mean, uh, we always knew, uh, you know, old Jimmy Chuck Berry, Johnny Hooker, mm -hmm. uh, Buddy Holly, mm -hmm. you know, we were always in that tradition all the time. I personally went into the folk music thing mm -hmm. because it was new to me and I realized that I, I didn't have that information. And, and, uh, 
and it still it still stuck. I mean, it still sticks with me. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was using the ballad form yeah. alongside of, and then a storytelling form, which that's how I I was able to write those songs because I learned it in the folk circles. Yeah, that form. Uh, but you can always you can always you can also tell the same story in a blues form, which which is, which one step beyond that blues would be rock and roll form. Mm -hmm. But uh, once you once you get into production, you ain't gonna really tell too much of a story at all, you know. And records nowadays are all they're all production. Yeah. You know? And you've avoided that in your records. I have, and I'm not sure it's a good or bad. You know, it's just as, it, it's just as, it's just as bad as as good. It's good because it allows me. I've been making records long enough, so I'm confident to go into the studio and just do it mm -hmm. without a producer. Because I started recording for John Hammond in 1960. And that's why yeah. he made records. Yeah. We'd go in to make a record live. It's a living thing. Yeah, recording the songs like that's right. that Playboy interview. That's the way I learned how to record, and that's the way other people were, were doing it. Yeah. Now you don't do it that way right. because the machinery is, is they got you know it's like that. Uh, you you you're going to record a studio now and I'm what I do is obsolete. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't use half the time to use a decent studio. I mean we made the last record we made street legal mm -hmm. in, in a rehearsal hall. You know and only because we couldn't get a studio booked in town. You know. Yeah. So uh, yeah I could use a good producer. And I could make some well-produced records because I my songs are good enough. I mean, you don't need but a, a, a fairly decent song, you know, to to get a to have a a, a well-produced record. Well, it seems that there were. Well, I think of one album, New Morning, as the closest thing to like a Dylan Pop produced album. That seems yeah. to me it seemed to have a, a sort of pastel, if that's the word, texture to it. Yeah. And uh, uh, in mean, many ways, I don't. It's probably an album that that people don't take it seriously. I don't think they do, but if you really you, you listen to that album, you realize I had the girls on there with me too. Yeah. Some people complain about the girls, you know, uh, but uh, uh, I hear this sound that these particular girls make, and, and then this is our background singers. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, you'll see the show tonight. You'll see they're not the eye cats, they're not uh, <laughs> very mannerless girls, and they're, and they're not. They, they they sing in the way the, these songs should be sung. Yeah. Know? Well, I guess you feel it just wouldn't be Bob Dylan. It wouldn't be the Bob Dylan style if you went in and did a produced album, you know, with all the overdubs. Oh, no, no. I, at this time, I don't, I don't have the time to do it. Oh. Or the patience, you know. Because we've been on the road now so long. I had two weeks to make an album this year. Mm -hmm. That's all I had was, was two weeks. And fortunately, we managed to do it. If I hadn't done that two weeks, I wouldn't have had a record out. And then, you know how way it is, after a certain amount of time, you won't do those songs anymore. Mm -hmm. so, so you lose them. I would think with someone like you then, if you started to labor over those songs with overdubs, that it would probably kill the purity that you might feel in, in well, the rest. Well, I feel that you can do it both. I haven't done it that way, but I feel that you can go in. See, my records, first of all, they take a week or two to make. Other people, Eagles go in and make a record, they'll take a year. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. Every time they're off the road, they'll go work on it, and that's what they'll be doing. They'll be making that record, and it'll be important to them. Mm -hmm. And me, I don't do that because I don't have a producer. Uh, what can I tell you? I mean, you could get any producer you want. I guess That's the right. impression what you're saying is you don't feel there's a producer, there's a producer you know of that could be that sympathetic. I'm, I'm searching for one right now, as a matter of fact. As a matter of fact, I'm searching for a, a, a qualified record producer. I mean, listen to one of those songs with the Bee Gees. You know, li listen to one of those songs, and if you hear the song underneath the song, yeah. that's the real song. Yeah. But what you listen to in a, in, a, in a room or a record player or disco is that live beat and that and that swell, you know, yeah. that what is it kind of yeah. thing, you know, it just sounds good. It's like very angelic and it's got the beat to it too. Um, well, that's an interesting point right there, the concept of disco that has begun to dominate like one, maybe one whole half of like what people are thinking of pop and rock music in the 70s. And to me, I reflect it as a kind of mechanical, uh, you know, kind of mechanical machine music that's there to sustain a mood and a rhythm, but it seems in opposition to the whole mainstream of 60s music, the stuff you were into and the Beatles yeah. stuff. It is, but its purpose, the main purpose is to make people dance mm -hmm. and get their troubles. Mm -hmm. Now, you and me, maybe we go down to, to a bar and listen to a bar band, and you feel like dancing, you can dance, you feel like drinking, you can drink. But these people, they get dressed up and they want to go out and boogie yeah. in, in, a, in a sophisticated kind of a way. 
Yeah. And that music allows them to do it. And it's too late to go back because they because it's all it's all done with machinery. And it's perfectly legitimate. People want to dance, and it then it, it creates a, a, a an environment for them to do it in. Yeah, but it seems so amoral. Isn't it? No, not involved. even the disco music. And there's a decadent sort of amorality to the to the to the disco. Well, uh, they was, always say that the devil is, is always uh, you know involved in dancing. You know, now that one side says that I personally don't believe it at all, and just some of the great religions of the world don't believe it either. Well, that idea of amorality equated with evil crops up in uh, a book you might have read. It. I don't know if you have The World According to Garf. It's just out now. John Irving. Yeah, I've heard of it. It equates evil, the evil in the world. Not as such a mysterious force, it equates it with an absence of morality. Mm. You know, keeping faith between people uh, in, in a marriage, let's say, is the hardest thing to do. In other words, the evil is, is, a, is, is a force that is simple because it exists. Good is more a uh, human uh, <laughs> creation. I was, beginning to, I was trying to equate that perhaps to your music in which notions of evil and good sort of trade back in the images of good and evil, bad and good, constructive and destructive, sort of trade back and forth with uh, often equal power. And the only, the only thing that overcomes one or supports the other is the personal faith of, uh, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the singer mm -hmm. or, the, or the people involved. Uh, but that's always true. I mean, even in the old ballads, the singers that used to sing, they used to lay it out in the you know, same way, and, and the singer was the, the, the voice which could decide for you, the listener, you know, which side was right and which side was wrong. Mm -hmm. There can't be such a thing. Mm -hmm. I personally don't think good news has got anything to do with marriage at all. <laughs> marriage, when you get into, sometimes you find it's just a job. Being faithful to oneself is, is, more, is, more, is more worthy than being faithful to an idea or, or something which is transient. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. It changes all the time. Yes. It's illusory. You're always grasping it, you know. You're wondering what you grasp, and even when you get a hold of it, you don't have anything. The anger that I feel in so much of your stuff in the 60s, resurfacing, I don't feel it so much on, let's say, an album like Street Legal, mm -hmm. but maybe in a couple songs. The, the, the changing of the guard and the uh, no time to think. Well, we put aside the anger for the time being because the anger doesn't drive. The 60s was a driven time. Was driving anger was driving everybody. Mm -hmm. so, so that's what you're pushing, anger. But nowadays, uh, you can't be pushed by that no more. You have to just deal with anger. It's out in front of you, except instead of behind you. That's the way I see it anyway. Are you bored by rock and roll? Did you feel that it just would uh, cloud you by no, being competitive? No, I, I, I don't know what you mean by rock and roll. I, I mean, I'm yeah, yeah, you mentioned it yourself, the Fleetwood Mac stuff. Well, I, I don't know if I'd call it rock and roll. I think maybe that would be pop. Okay. R rock and roll, uh, That's fair. it's just a 12-bar beat, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a backbeat. That's all rock and roll. It's just a backbeat. That's yeah. all you need to play rock and roll. Yeah. And uh, that kind of rock and roll is, is, you know, is whatever, whatever the subject matter is about. It's got the backbeat, and uh, you can move to it. And it makes you feel alive. But uh, uh, for me, I mean, I've never. Uh, I'm, I used to play rock and roll, if that's what it was called when I was growing up, but uh, I, I saw these people that have died, you know? Mm -hmm. I've seen Buddy Holly play. I've seen Eddie Cochran play. Mm -hmm. I've seen Sam Cooke. I've seen all these people that are dead. Um, and uh, now a day goes by when I don't think about all these people. The death of Elvis. There's another case. How did you react? I was stunned. Mm -hmm. Something I never had thought about. Mm -hmm. I mean, I thought if anybody else is going to live forever. I saw no reason for his death. When you survived that motorcycle accident in '66, I guess that was a real brush that brought a That was a brush. I survived that, but what I survived after that was even harder to survive in the, in the motorcycle crash. That was just a physical crash, uh -huh. but uh, sometimes the things in life that you cannot see are harder to survive than something which you, you know, can pin down. Could you pin that down a little more for me? I mean, you say what you survived after that. Well, that crash was like in 1967 or 66. Uh -huh. 
And uh, at that time, I deserved to crash because I, I certainly couldn't have done it. Uh, it was just some, you know, the great spirit telling me, you know, you, know, you need a rest. Mm -hmm. And uh, but, but that had nothing <laughs> to do with me. That crash. After that, I was what had what I survived. After that was man-made. Your own, yeah, you know. your own making. Mm -hmm. I guess it humbled you when you crashed. Well, I don't recall what I was thinking about. I looked at the season for a while. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, John Wesley Harding, maybe I'm wrong in saying, resulted from that. Well, at that time, uh, I had not recorded for a while. I don't think I, I, might, I might have had a new contract coming up, which I think I did. I didn't know how to record the way other people were recording, and I didn't want to. The Beatles had just released Sergeant Pepper, which I didn't like uh, at all because uh, I didn't like, I could see that it, it was, I talk about indulgence, I thought that was a very indulgent album, although the songs on it were real good, I just didn't think that all that production was necessary mm -hmm. because the Beatles had never done it before. Mm -hmm. uh, the Stones did it too, but something they were doing. Uh, Mick had that song out, 10,000 uh, uh, Year Old Man or something like that. That sort of came after Sergeant Pepper. Yeah. Sort of copied okay. Him and at that yeah. time, uh, Janis Joplin was starting to make it big. Jimi Hendrix was starting to make it big. Grateful Dead were making it yeah. big. There was a lot of stuff happening that uh, 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 I just didn't quite uh, understand um, at that at that period of time. Uh, none of us did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we didn't figure that had anything to do with anything. Although Janice was great. Uh, Janice was great, but the, the psychedelic music scene, that's really what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And Jimmy Hendrix, was, what he was doing with, with, his, with his guitar was was, uh, was fine, but then all, all the, the, uh, uh, all the producers started to get, get into everything. Anyway, we were, we were caught. We were caught. We were up there in Woodstock, so we were laying down songs. And at that period of time, we're laying on all these songs on tape. We're just writing them and singing them onto a tape. And uh, I was going to have to go in and make a record. And I figured, well, is this the kind of stuff I want to do on my record? And I'd, I'd sing the songs and I'd say, I don't, didn't feel that, it didn't feel right. I mean, I didn't want to, I didn't figure I was saying anything different. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Except in my particular type of way it was. But then I went back and just wrote real simple songs. It was the first time I ever did an album, ever wrote a song, as a matter of fact. There's only two songs on the album which came at the same time as the music. The rest of the songs was written out on paper. And I found the tunes for them later. I hadn't done it, didn't do it before, and I, hadn't done, I haven't done it since. Mm -hmm. um, that might account for the specialness of that album. Yeah. And it, you know, it came out at a time. Uh, we it was live in the studio, yeah. and uh, I knew it wasn't going to stay there very long, though. But it was it was special, and I still sing them songs. Man, the powerful songs, and it took so long. I mean, because as I say, you were pick, I was picking up that album, expecting you to like roll to have rolled along. Great, but you know, you sort of went back to a the pastoral, a rustic. It wasn't quite folk. It was more, you know, swinging a country, which would solidify with the uh -huh. Nashville skyline. Right. And uh, I hear you. But the thing is, see, I've never broke tradition. I've never broke tradition. I've never mm -hmm. gone and done something that had no tradition behind it. Yeah. And uh, uh, well, when I when I broke, finally, I broke it at John Wesley Hardy, and I started out again. And I knew it wasn't where I was going to stay very long, but I had to explore all that territory. And never did until I got to. Uh, uh, blood on the tracks did I finally get a hold of what I needed to get a hold of and once I got a hold of that blood on the tracks wasn't it either and neither was desire but street legal comes the closest Doesn't to to where uh, my music is going at, at, for you know for the rest of the time All right. um, it, it, it has to do with the illusion of time I mean what the songs are necessarily about is the illusions of time. Now, in the old days, they used to do it automatically, mm -hmm. but, but it's like I had amnesia mm -hmm. in, 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 in 1966. I couldn't remember how to do it. And I tried to force learn it, and I couldn't learn what I, what I had been able to do naturally, like Highway 61 Revisited. I mean, you can't sit down and write that consciously. I guess not. I mean, because it has to do with the breakup of time. See, and... Fragmentation. Yeah. Fragmentation is such an important part, I guess, in your mm -hmm. art. I feel that. 
you know, it's got, I mean, it just, in one, in four lines, in the first four lines, it covers all you need to cover. And it covers the past, present, future. I had to learn how to do that consciously because I learned in 75 that I was going to have to do it from now on consciously. And those are the kind of songs I wanted to write. The ones that do have the break of time where there is no time. Try to make the focus as strong as a, as a, as a magnifying glass under the sun, mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, and to do it consciously, is a trick, you know, and um, I did it on that, um, I did it on Blood on the Track for the first time, and I didn't know, I knew how to do it because it was a technique I learned. I actually had a teacher for it, and, uh, uh, who was that? There's an old man in New York, uh, who was, a uh, who, who knew about that, and, uh, so I picked up what I could. Do you feel that Blood on the Tracks and Desire were sort of sentimental albums? Well, Blood on the Tracks was, was, hit, hit, did consciously what I used to do unconsciously. I didn't perform it well. I wasn't into, I didn't have the power to perform it well. But I, uh, I did write the songs and some of them, they could be changed, but the idea was right. Uh, the, it might be sentimental in a way because maybe I was sentimental and trying, if it wasn't a way, Sentimental. I mean, I was fighting sentimentality all the way down the line, mm -hmm. and uh, desire was a little different. Uh, but of course, uh, I had a co-writer on that, and uh, we both brought our own ideas to it. You know, um, it seemed like Blood on the Tracks was a confession. It was real personal. It was a real chronicle. I could see that in a, in, a, in your fragmented way, like on Tangled Up in Blue, you were sort of telling the story. Yeah, you got. Right. I, I tied it into your relationship with Sarah. Uh -huh. Well, here's the thing. There might be some little part of me which is confessing something which I've experienced and I know, but it's not definitely the total me uh -huh. confessing anything. I mean, when Mick Jagger singing Beast of Burden, yeah. you know what I mean? He, there's some little, something in there in, in him is confessing, but that's... You just, you just do that. Yeah. So, also, other song in the Rolling Stones album, which seems like it's for you, but uh, some girl's song, where he yeah. sings it in your voice, just about. He sings well, it about, give me a lethal dose. Well, Mick is always... Kind of thing. I hear myself and Mick a lot, you know, and uh, uh, but I don't know what you mean. He's got Zuma Beach on it. Yeah, I don't live on Zuma Beach. I think he's talking about Neil Young. <laughs> yeah, because he yeah. he lives on Zuma Beach. Or good, and I've never lived there. That house you built in, uh, on the coast. Uh, I don't know the story with it. Was that sort of a, a Xanadu for you? Did you be no, that? Uh -uh. No, not really. Uh, no, you know, it's a long story. I don't think you'd even be interested. It, it was, it, uh, the house just happened, yeah. you know. Um, it, actually, it wasn't, it happened accidentally. I mean, I, I wasn't paying too much attention to what was happening, but I had a man who, who knew how to, who, who, who did know. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't really paying too much attention and, and uh, you know, it just got a little larger than usual and a little spread out, but yeah. uh, that is an end of it. Sort of like you dealt with a lucid chapter, like a man, a man builds a massive uh, house with a dome, you know. No, no, that's not, I don't think, my home is where my heart is, you know, and I, uh, I just don't think of uh, stones and wood and, you know. And, and you, feel you, more, you feel more at home now? I, this might be obvious, but I guess... You feel more at home doing this, traveling around? Well, I've been doing it for all the road. Road. I mean, That's all I've done. Huh? I mean, it's your life. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I know you've said things like you could be happy uh, with, a, with a real settled down life, coming home with a wife. Oh, definitely. Uh, I, could, I guess you want that again. I, I wouldn't mind. I, I, I could, uh, uh, you know, I'd be real happy being, uh, I could be perfectly happy, content uh, being a bus driver. Mm -hmm. You know? Uh, I mean, if all this faded away, uh, wouldn't bother me. I mean, I could do that, you know. I'd be, I'd have had a, quite an experience doing it, but uh, uh, I still could go back to, you know, making pizza or something. I don't know. <laughs> do you really think? Well, maybe you know. It seems everybody else is dealing with the problem of trying to make their mark. And then maybe for the man who has made his mark, it's, uh, it's it's easy to it's easy to say hey you know I don't care if I would, if we're in a job where I wasn't making well, well, in immediate sense in, in immediate sense well you need love you have to have people who love you you know you have to have people you identify with and your companions and you have to be love in your corner 
mm-hmm. you know, uh, uh-huh. and, and there's no, you know, and if you don't have that, well, then nothing you're doing is going to be satisfying to you. Um, Do you feel that's missing? In my life, no, I don't feel it's missing. I mean, I might have, I've got much less than I've ever had, but I've got love. Uh-huh. You know, so that makes me feel that I get more. But in physical terms, <clears throat> I really don't. Uh, but, uh... Has your, your vision of women, of woman, changed significantly since, uh... Well, I mean, it's not like just like a woman. Mm-hmm. It's a that's true. Song. That's true. I believe that. Uh, I believe that that's, that feeling and that's only true and I can grasp it, you know, when I'm singing it. That's why I live. But, you know, yeah. But, uh, I mean, you're looking for a true companion and a woman. I mean, uh... I can't, I can't stand to, you know, to, uh, to run with women anymore. I mean, I just can't, it don't, uh, uh, just, uh, it bothers me. I'd rather, I'd rather stand in front of a rolling train, you know. I know. Uh, it, it's, but if you find a woman, uh, that's more, more than a companion, that, that is also your sister and your, and your lover and your mother, you know, uh, if you find all them, all them, ideas in one woman, well then you got a companion for life, you know, you don't ever have to think about it. Uh, is that woman, yeah. is there a woman like that, though, really? I mean, I mean, it's like that woman you're saying, is she the mother and the sister, and she's also looking at you saying, is he the father? Yeah, right, your father, the son, you know, <laughs> the baby, you know, like, but that's, that's the way, that's the way life really is, so. Well, I've got five kids, you know. I know you do. And, uh, you know, it's heartbreaking, you don't want to leave kids, but, I mean, you know, you just have to adjust to it. How many boys, how many girls? I can't even remember. <laughs> You've done a really good job of keeping them out of uh, getting swallowed up by oh, the news no, house. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, nobody's really interested. I mean, there's, you know, I mean, in, if they are, uh, that's one thing people don't generally do. I mean, there are some things in my life which is which is off limits, and, and, and I think any man on earth would agree to that. I would. You know? And me, they can do what they want with it. They can write about it, they can photograph me, you know, they can uh, say anything they want about and, uh, uh, you know, do what they want, generally. But, w- but with things that, there is a certain line which, which uh, nobody deserves to cross, you know. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think that's just a natural line. I mean, any, anybody would agree to that. Have your children expressed a desire to go into the music business? I hope not. I mean, they're all good musicians. They all can play. Uh-huh. But I don't, I don't want anybody, any kids to go to what I'm doing. It's not a good life. It's, I mean, it's not a natural thing. You know, it keeps you, it, keeps, it just puts you too much up in the air. It's too much of a commitment to... I think we're pulling out now. Okay.